get really good at hiring, right? Because your team is going to determine really whether or not you're going to be successful. And it's about the people. Um, all your business problems are people problems in disguise, right? So you can tail everything back to your people. So, you know, there are some of us that are entrepreneurs that are natural, like people are drawn to us and, you know, they want to work with us for whatever reason. Those it's great. But if you don't have those skills or that muscle, that's something that you really need to, to build upon. And, and you need to do it from the standpoint of who you are as you're building your business and what the values of the organization are. Because people who align with the organizational values are going to make a greater impact. They're going to be better hires. everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as a founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com and grab some time with us to chat. Now, today we've got another uh, great guest on the podcast, Rick Gerard. And uh, just a quick introduction to Rick. So he went to uh, art school, wanted to be a photographer, um, and then decided that that lifestyle wouldn't provide, or that wouldn't provide the lifestyle that he wanted. Um, so uh, recruited into a business by, I think, a cousin's husband, if I remember right. Uh, yeah. went, for, went for the opportunity um, because it was in the location that he can go snowboarding or uh, skiing and otherwise um, play, in the, or play in the snow. Um, so first six months were brutally hard, not a lot of training, but uh, then uh, continued to go for it, got good at it, uh, grinded through and uh, figured out how to do sales and became a top performer, got promoted to a manager, um, left the business and decided to move to California and started a business with a co-founder and did that for about three years. Um, before exiting the business and moving to Hawaii, and then uh, went to Hawaii for 10 years, uh, did a whole bunch of surfing, and maybe a little bit of work, um, and then met his wife, got married, had kids, and then moved back to uh, California and started his business that he's doing now. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Rick. Hey, well, thanks for having me, Devin. Man, that's a lot. That's a, you took really good (laughs) notes, because I know we had a conversation about it, but yeah. Hey, I always try and capture the essence of the journey, but I always it's always fun to unpack that a bit. So I just condensed a much longer journey into 30 seconds or so. So take us a little bit back in time and unpack it. How did your journey get started in, law, in, in art school? Well, you know, yeah, I just, I, I kind of was one of those kids. I was really big into surfing and snowboarding and I wasn't really that great at it. I was, I was good, but not like, you know, where I can make a living at it. Um, and that's where I was kind of, that's what I was passionate about. And um, so, you know, I started thinking about things that, you know, I like to do and I got into photography and kind of went to college for it and started, you know, started working for a professional photographer and doing assistant work and got into that world. And then uh, quickly noticed that, you know, making $125 a day for a 12 hour day um, it's not going to get me where I want to be. <laughs> and yeah, somewhere, um, but probably not where you want to be. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, I felt like I was just kind of a glorified construction worker slash film loader, like back in the day when they had film. Right. So uh, that's right. all I did. And, mm-hmm. um, and so, you know, my, my, my cousin's husband came to me and said, Hey, we're moving up to Sun Valley, Idaho. And if you want to come up, um, you know, you can have a job. And I'm like, sweet. I'll do it. I'm like, is there snowboarding there? Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. I just knew that he had a business and the guy was doing amazingly well. And so thank you, Rick Parzik for, you know, setting me on this journey. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, um, I, I kind of got into it. I had no idea what I was doing. I was probably the worst cold caller in the world for the first six months. And that's all, that's all, you know, the recruiting business is, it's cold calling pretty much. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I got lucky on a few things and then, uh, you know, just kind of progressed through the organization, became a manager. That, that's always a fun thing when you become a manager because you're a high performer and they teach you nothing and they go, okay, make it work. You know, I remember I like, hey, you figured it out. So now I'll figure out how to make other people do it. Exactly. Exactly. I remember, I remember having a conversation with my, 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 um, 
mentor at one point and he's like i'm like well look i don't know what i'm doing you know help me out he goes well just just do what you think i would do and i go i don't know what you would do you know so like, well just pick up some books and read them you know like so he he recommended like the one minute manager and something else and i'm like i mean i read them i still i i don't know what to do in situations because i haven't haven't encountered any of them so well, um, in a little bit it's a <laughs> trial by fire or baptism by fire that uh yeah, hey, figure it out. And uh, hey, if you succeed, then it'll be great for you. And if not, then you won't succeed and uh, you'll move on. So before exactly. we dive into the or one one question I did want to circle back on. So one of the things that you said that did draw you to there is, hey, I can go snowboard snowboarding. And that sounds like a fun adventure and a good way to have my free time. Did you get it with all of the work and learning and doing all the business? Did you get out on the slopes quite a bit? Or was it yeah. a dream that never came true? No, I did. I did. My goal was to get a season pass. And um, I think I moved there in like June and I had to buy it by October. So like I, I worked my butt off to be able to afford to buy my season pass. And then I bought my season pass and I would snowboard pretty much every day. Um, I got, I was getting like over a hundred days a year in snowboarding, but it was like, I'd go snowboard for lunch. I'd be the first one in the office and the last one to leave. And then I'd take two hour lunches. And so we had that flexibility so I go ride for two hours. It was great because the the office like looked out at the ski lift. And I could actually walk down to it. It was pretty nice. Actually, my house I could walk to the to the lift on right off of Bird Drive. So it was kind of nice. Yeah, oh, that, that sounds like a great office location and a, a great uh, uh, flexibility as far as uh, what you're able to do. So now I was just curious because it wasn't necessarily essential to your journey, but that was uh, yeah. one of the reasons you moved there. So now you're saying, OK, moving up to manager, I kind of had to figure out how to do the sales thing. I get better at it. And that's usually what happens. Now they move to manager and, and, you, and you know, you kind of take on the responsibility of training others. And so how did your where did your story go from there? Yeah, I um. I, I, I really had a hard time with being a, a leader and a manager. Like I, like I, I struggled with that a lot because I, I was either like the one doing all the work and then getting frustrated with everybody else because they weren't producing and then I'm feeding everybody. And then I was just kind of feeling really resentful about it or I wasn't doing enough work and I was handing stuff off. And it was just like this weird balancing act. So, you know, I, I didn't really, like I, like I said, I didn't get a lot of help. But I decided, hey, look, you know what? I'm going to just go learn something. So I actually enrolled in a community college like management course just so I can kind of get an idea of what I'm doing. Did get a little bit of flack for that. But, you know, it was kind of like um, it was worth it. You know, it's something I had to do. No, and I think, I mean, you know, and what's interesting is you kind of hit on, but what I found here, you know, in, in my experience and watching others is sometimes you can be an awesome salesperson, you excel at it, you can figure out what that is, and yet they move into manager and salespeople just hate it because now you're yeah. going from sales and calls and, and meeting people and be able to talk to, now you have to try and manage people and deal with their problems and train them and do be in meetings and it's just a much different shift and some people love it and move over to it and some people say i just want to go back to what i enjoyed and what gave me the freedom and the flexibility plus sometimes you make more sales people because you're able to um, get out and close a lot of deals and get commissioned so it definitely makes sense on how that might not have uh, been the desirable position that uh, it's, it sounded like it, it may have been so i think it or as your journey or continued you left that business and then moved to California and started another business with the co-founder. Is that right? Yeah, I actually with the with uh, my same mentor, like he actually moved back. We moved back to California, started up another business. We grew that during the whole dot com boom. It was a recruiting mm -hmm. firm. I mean, it was it was a fun journey because in three years, I think um, we we exploded. And during that whole dot com boom, I remember like people were just hiring crazy. You know, we worked with pets.com and I think we we built them an ungodly amount of money like in six months. And what was interesting about it is like they were just hiring anybody. I remember the hiring manager saying, you know, as long as somebody has Java on their resume, like we'll hire them. Like we have all we have half an office. It's empty and we need to fill all these seats. It was just it was crazy. And um, and then, yeah, that was all like right before kind of like that whole 9-11 thing happened. And then we decided uh, to, I, I decided to go a different direction. Um, my, my partner wanted to go into biotech and some other areas. And I wanted to stay in tech. And um, 
So and I wanted to grow. Like one question we didn't answer, which is what made you, so was it, did you guys kind of both decide you're going to make an exit together and you're going to move to California? Or did he have the idea, started the business and thought you'd be great for it or kind of, how did you move from that manager position to decide, Hey, we're going to pick up, go with the, my mentor and go to California. Kind of what was that transition or how did that occur? Yeah, they decided like, actually it was kind of a, so I was up in Idaho for, I think, five years. And then um, I, I was kind of get, I, I loved living up there, but it would just kind of like, I missed the ocean. I missed some of the other things. And, um, and so he decided he was going to move back. We talked about it and like, he's like, we'll just start up a new company and grow it vertically. And we'll grow a really big, like well-oiled recruiting firm. And I'm like, great, let's do it. So it wasn't uh there wasn't a whole lot of in-depth, like lengthy conversations about it. It was kind of like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> hey, sounds like a great adventure. Another great place to go play for the two-hour lunches. Why not? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. So now you do that. So, and say, okay, I'm going to, you know, I go out there and it sounds like, you know, you guys got going. And then as, you know, as the business continued to grow, you guys wanted to take it in different directions. And so you guys decided to, you know, it sounds like, you know, at least as I read between the lines, amicably part ways. And then yeah. you say, well, you know, California is nice, but really where I should go is Hawaii because Hawaii sounds even better for, for playing in the, on the beach. Is that about the, the thought process or how did you kind of decide you're going to go to Hawaii for a while? That, that was it. That was it. Like I, it, it was decided over breakfast on a Saturday morning where I was just like, you know what? I really don't want to go start up another biotech group or anything like that. Like I, I don't want to, I want to grow either up or out. And, uh, and, you know, and the, that wasn't really the option on his end. So I'm like, well, you know what, Let, let's just, let's just part ways. I'm going to pack up and move to Hawaii. You know, like I had wanted to move to Hawaii. So it just it gave me that opportunity to be able to do that. So oh, that, that's awesome. And so now I, and I may have missed it, but did, did you have a job lined up or did you know what you're going to do in Hawaii or just said, Hawaii is a destination that sounds fun. And that's where I'm going to go figure out a job. Yeah, I mean, I basically exited my interest and then decided, hey, I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go ahead and figure it out. I was gonna start up a company and build it in Hawaii. That was the plan. Right. Um, did you know I did. I started up a be, company called. Did you... Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. No, I was gonna say, did you know what the company was gonna be, or did that come later? Yeah, I was gonna. Yeah, I was starting up another recruiting firm, but I took some time off. I took at least. Well, uh, my my plan was to take a year off and then then start building but i incorporated right away when i got there and i got the company kind of up and running and then i met somebody who was doing recruiting in japan from hawaii and he needed some help so i i actually joined up with him and helped him kind of get his organization streamlined and, and get things built out for himself no and so, that sounds like it and it sounds like it was a, a fun time you know so and you were there you I, I think if i remember right you said that you didn't intend there to be there quite as long maybe six months or a year and then you end up staying 10 years no no i had planned on like that i was oh. going to stay there for a while yeah <laughs> you're going to retire in hawaii and just uh, have a business and have some fun i was somewhat retired i mean i, I don't think i would ever kind of retire because i have to have something going on but um yeah, Hawaii is like a really interesting place to try and build a business, especially a business that's doing business on the mainland, you know, mm. so it was it was uh, it was challenging, but, um, you know, I, I, I kind of knew at some point I'd probably move back just because, you know, this is where you build things and I'm a builder and by nature for a long time I wasn't really building anything substantial so. Oh, and that uh, that definitely makes sense. And yeah, I think along the way, as you were doing it, you also met your wife and that was part of the, the journey while you're in Hawaii. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I met my wife. Um, we got married and then we had my daughter and then we started getting pressure from the in-laws. Right. Like and then my my parents like, when are we going to see our granddaughter? Why don't you move back? So that kind of forced the issue a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um you should have just told them, hey, we live in Hawaii. It's a great vacation. You can come here. It's free board. We'll probably give you some food and it'll be a great time that you can come and take a, some time off every year. That would have been my pitch. Yeah. <laughs> well, what it kind of was. And then, you know, we, we actually talked about it quite a bit. And um, I was itching to kind of get back and build something again. And mm -hmm. so that was the 
I, I, you know, I do, I do really well with, with partners. And, and so, um, you know, I had a partner that I kind of joined up with and, and so that was, that was kind of the plan. And then, you know, since we've been here, we, we parted ways, but, but uh, it's been, it's been good. So. Hey, that, that definitely makes sense. So, so you say, okay, coming or in-law pressure, I want to go back to where I can build something. I want to or continue to, you know, or cultivate something. California is a place for me because it's a nice place to live, you know, a little expensive for my taste, but otherwise a nice place. And uh, you, so you come <laughs> back and you, and you come build something and you say, okay, now did you, again, kind of as you're moving back to the, you know, the, or the, the lower 48 or upper 48, whichever direction it is from or Hawaii, um, yeah. you know, as you're coming back, uh, did you have an idea of what you wanted to build as you got back to California or was it kind of more of all get back, get settled and then start something or how did you kind of transition to that next phase? Yeah. So the transition was, you know, basically to, to build another recruiting firm. Um, I think I realized a few years in, um, I actually didn't want to build another like large firm um, because I, I found there's some inherent, like, some really, really systemic challenges and things about the business that um, that weren't really working for me. You know, we were doing contingency search, which means, you know, um, basically it's free unless you hire one of my guys and then you pay me a big lump sum. And um, and so we sh shifted. I shifted the model around, and then we started really doing. Um, value-driven search for companies from the perspective of being retained and also being in a position where like we really help solve their problems as opposed to just kind of slinging resumes over and hoping they hire one of our people. Now, and I'm just curious more than anything, because I've, I've got, I've seen both sides and, you know, I, predominantly what I've seen in the industry is more of, hey, we'll hire you, you know, you'll have a, you'll get a percentage of their first year's pay, or you'll have yeah. maybe a flat fee that's pretty steep that you say, okay, I'll do that. So how did you kind of shift that model or what did you do to kind of set that up to be a bit different to where it's providing more of, hey, we're actually provide as opposed to finding, going out, finding a whole bunch of resumes, throwing them over. And if they happen to hire one, then you get the payment. How did you kind of shift to that value model? Yeah, you know, so one of the things I realized back when I had hair um, was that um, hiring managers, and nobody likes to admit this, but like a lot of uh, people in the interview process don't know how to interview people. And so there, there's, a, there's a big kind of area where when two people go into an, a room and they do conduct an interview, you have no visibility to what happens there. And, you know, there's, there's kind of questions you can't ask that get asked sometimes. One and then number two, uh, it's usually just like it's like a speed date. You know, tell me about this. Okay, great. Okay, and tell me about that. Okay, great. It, it's just like this really surfacey, uh, not going deep under the hood conversation that gives you really um, a whole interview is basically just run off of bias. I mean, that's really like what it what it breaks down to. So I set out to tackle that problem with a lot of the clients that I was working with. So the way we packaged it was, hey, look, at we do, we do what we call engage search. And if we work with you, if we choose to work together, one of the things we bring is an interview process. And so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna put together an interview process for you that you're going to lead this search with. And um, that way, it's going to ensure that you're going to find the strongest person for your organization. And it, it worked out. It started to like it, it was a, it was a lot of kind of fine tuning the method, but started working. And then I started seeing clients that were coming back to me saying, OK, you know, we hired our VP here through your process and we really loved it. How do we roll this out into the rest of the organization? And so I had some clients hire me to like, you know, come in and fix that problem. And so um, We've just been evolving that with the search and it's not really anything that any other search firm really puts into play. I mean, they'll put in some interview strategy, um, but again, I, I feel like it's, it's just kind of, um, it's slapping a bandaid on a gaping wound that, that never gets solved, right? So. No, so I, I made it my that, mission to solve that problem, basically. Oh, no, and I think it's a great one because I, I, 
you know, learned by some hard experience and had some, or, you know, some or good or hires and good success, but it is one where a lot of times it, it does feel almost like an analogy of speed dating to where, you know, yeah. you'll have maybe one or a couple interviews, at least early on before I figured out what better process it works, at least for us. Um, but then, you know, you have a couple interviews, a resume looks well, and you'll hire them on, and then it's 50 50 if they work out well. And I don't know the, the exact odds, but, you know, the, yeah. you're taking a bit of a gamble because it's hard to really figure out is it is a good or a good fit and so solving that problem and making a more valuable hire i think definitely makes sense and uh, provides a, a much more of that value so hey that's a definitely a great model yeah so, and i feel like i feel like you know as leaders we should be really good at hiring but we're not you know we should make it our mission that like hey look at in order for this organization to succeed i gotta get good at hiring Yep. And, um, you know, and still at best, a lot, most companies have like a 50, 50 chance they're going to make the right decision. So, you know, some companies should just go in, flip a coin and, and say, okay, you're hired or you're up, you know, it's tails, you're out. <laughs> so maybe a weed out the resumes and they just say, okay, we've got these two and you just turn around and do a blindfold and, and pick one. So no, yep. but I think that there's definitely a, a better way to do that than just kind of that blind hiring and work or hoping it works out. And then you put all that time and effort both into the hiring process and onboarding and training people only to, you know, ha a lot of the time having to redo that process yet again. So I think that yeah. there's definitely a, a much better way. And it sounds like you've solved that. So now as we've kind of got to, you know, present day, so we've come or come through your journey there's always two questions I ask at the end of each podcast. So why don't we jump to those now? Sure. Um, so the first question I always ask is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made and what'd you learn from it? Um, you know, I, I've been one of these people that I always make the wrong choice first and, but I learn from it. Right. So I, I do everything wrong and, you know, I, I endure that pain. I don't know if that's just my, my cross I'm bearing. I don't know. But for some reason, I usually and, and I've been making a mental shift to actually like, OK, I'm, I'm inclined to go this way. So maybe I should go that way. So I, I've um, I've taken a a very kind of opposite approach. Right. Like George Costanza in Seinfeld. Right. Um, he started doing the opposite of what he would normally do. And then as a result, he ended up like getting a job with the Yankees, moving out of his parents' house, got a girlfriend, <laughs> you know, everything worked out. Um, so uh, when, when I did uh, move down here to Orange County, I actually kind of got really excited about working with a friend of mine. And um, we just kind of came together without a whole lot of conversation and started working together. And then found out very quickly that the expectations were completely misaligned and we were not a good mesh for each other. And so um, that was the, that was probably one of the biggest um, misfires that I did on my end. Like I did no do no diligence at all. And uh, as a matter of fact, I probably, you know, we, again, it was like probably a 30 minute conversation before we made the decision to, to, um, to do that. One of the things that I learned from that was if you're going to have conversations with people, then you really need to set expectations up front. And so I created an expectations document that I do with people when, when we're talking about working together, where, hey, this is, this is kind of really laying out my plans for the business and what my roles and responsibility are and, and, and you laying out what your you know, pain, desire, and impact is. That you want to have for the organization then you can roll into it and if we're in alignment then great we can work together if we're not then we shouldn't no and i think that i think that there's a, a lot to unpack there but i think a lot of times it is interesting sometimes we make the wrong decisions or we have to we're continuing learning and then say i'm going to do the opposite or i'm going to try something outside the box or different or we're going to break the mold so to speak and a yeah. lot of times that's where the success arises so i think that that's both an interesting you know worst business decision but also something that be great to learn from it Second question is, if you're talking to somebody that's just getting into a, a startup or a small business, what'd be the one piece of advice you'd give them? Get really good at hiring, right? Because your team is going to determine really whether or not you're going to be successful. And it's about the people. Um, all your business problems are people problems in disguise, right? So you can tail everything back to your people. So, you know, there are some of us that are entrepreneurs that are natural, like people are drawn to us 
and you know they want to work with us for whatever reason. Those it's great, but if you don't have those skills or that muscle, that's something that you really need to to build upon, and, and you need to do it from the standpoint of who you are as you're building your business and what the values of the organization are, because people who align with the organizational values are going to make a greater impact. They're going to be better hires. And so take the time to sit down, you know, even on a, on a napkin with a crayon and write out what your values are and really like put those into motion and put those out there. No, and I think that is, that's definitely great advice and defining what the values are and, and, and putting it, I like, you know, whether it's a napkin, it doesn't have to be arduous, doesn't have to be long. No. I think some people have in their mind, they have to have a big meeting and everybody give their input and you go through it and pick apart every word. And a lot of times it's like, you know, what are your values? What are you trying to accomplish? Let's write it down. Let's put it somewhere and make sure we have that well-defined and then let's get to work. And so I think that, that yeah. that's a great, uh, great takeaway. Well, if you're a startup or an entrepreneur, like there's probably one to two, maybe three of you, right? Like, so sit in a room for a half a day and do it. And it, it's not that much work, right? Oh, and I think that, I think that that's a great point. And it, it kind of, I think also helps to get everybody aligned or on the same page. So, you know, this is what everybody has in mind. And maybe, you know, two people have something different, but then you can look mm -hmm. to see how we're going to accomplish those or incorporate it. And it tends to better align things and if people are just kind of having different missions in mind. So I think that's a, a great uh, piece of advice. Yeah, every startup needs a North Star. Exactly. Yeah. Well, as we as we uh, wrap up and if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to use your service to hire their next employee, they want to be an employee of yours, they want to be an investor, or they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, and find out more? I'll take them all. Well, I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. It's Rick uh, Girard, G-I-R-A-R-D. Um, if you are an entrepreneur and you want help with putting a system in place for interviewing, um, I did release a book called Healing Career Wounds uh, in May. And it's an entrepreneur guide to um, when winning the strongest hires for your startup. And it even goes down into giving you scripts of what to say and how to say it and why to say it. Um, and um, I, I, too, have a podcast like, you know, like you, Devin, um, it's called Higher Power Radio. It's H-I-R-E Power Radio. It's not a religious show, but, um, you know, you can you can find me pretty much there. I'm, I'm pretty visible everywhere. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage people to connect up any or all the, the ways provided. Uh, it sounds like both a, a great book to check out, great resources. And if you're looking to make better hires, definitely a, a resource to keep in mind. Well, yeah. thank you again for uh, coming on the podcast. It's been no fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to tell and you'd like to be a guest on the podcast, we'd love to have you. Um, just go to inventiveguest.com, apply to be on the show. A um, couple more things as listeners, make sure to click subscribe, make sure to click share, make sure to leave us a review because we want to make sure that everyone finds out about all these awesome episodes. And last but not least, if you ever need help with your uh, business, with patents, trademarks, or anything else, just uh, feel free to reach out to us. Go to strategymeeting.com grab some time with us to chat. Well, thank you again, Rick, for coming on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thank you so much for having me, Devin. Absolutely. Absolutely.